From the infamous Illuminati to the modern Freemasons, the world is fascinated with secret societies. Tales of child sacrifice, world domination, and dark dealings with extraterrestrials are all paraded before us as truth. From angels and demons to the Da Vinci Code, one author at least has made an incredible living out of the whole world of conspiracies. The New World Order, famously penned by the science fiction writer H.G. Wells, has become a reality in the minds of millions, and today its leaders are even believed by some to be reptilian shapeshifters. The massive amounts of information set before us now on the World Wide Web may be spreading further and faster than ever before, but the belief in a powerful and secret ruling elite is nothing new. In fact, secret societies have been around almost as long as man. The early Christians, for instance, were a secretive cult themselves, undermining the governments of church and state. They adhered to secret forms of communication, had rituals, and were aggressive in their rise to power, spreading the word of their God far and wide. It takes generations, but a secret society here can be proven to have influenced our culture, our beliefs, and to have eventually grasped power itself. This pattern can easily be found in many other forms, such as Islam, the Roman and Greek empires, revolutionary Russia, and many more. In order for us to truly comprehend the whole picture, we have to stand back from history, religion, and political beliefs. We have to be neutral, neither fulfilling some fantasy that Blofeld is sitting in a large metallic room stroking a white cat and plotting our doom, nor being so naive that we do not believe men in power grouped together. Men have always grouped together for strength. It is an evolutionary device and a powerful energy within us. So also do greed, envy and lust surge through our veins, and to deny them is to deny our nature. But to understand them and find balance in strength and compassion is a virtue. One of the most confusing elements for any researcher coming to the world of secret societies afresh is the dualism they discover. On the one hand, the researcher will uncover ancient esoteric teaching passed on from one to another for generations. On the face of it, this teaching appears worthy and holds great psychological and spiritual truths. But then we also find that these secret societies have also been implicated in some bloody and awful periods in human history. We appear to have found a paradox, and splits then occur, not just within the societies themselves, but in those researching them. Following many years of research into the mind of man and the history of his actions, I am of the opinion that this paradox can be explained simply. It is the nature of man emerging or manifesting itself within the group. All men are divided within themselves, so our ancient texts and even our modern psychologists tell us. This division is communicated to the wider human body, the society. 
This is the reason that Democrats and Republicans, who both want similar ends, find themselves on opposite sides of the political divide. In such divisions in our society, we see the duality of the human mind revealed before us in often graphic terms. Secret societies gather these divisions together. After all, Democrats and Republicans are Freemasons. Secret societies are no different to any other group in our world. They have a hierarchy of control. They have community-spirited events and rituals. They hold a series of belief systems, just as any religion or political party. But the big difference is that they keep their hierarchy, events, rituals and belief systems a secret. They hide them in code, cipher and symbolism. And it has been this way for millennia, for it is also a part of our nature. This is the true power base of the world's secret societies, that they understand our nature, our minds, our yearnings, and they utilize this knowledge for whatever ends they currently see fit, just as any good religion or government has done for centuries. Such knowledge has been handed down within the group ever since it was discovered. But other forms of knowledge were also passed along. The wisdom of the stars has found a life outside of the groups as astrology, and yet this was originally the knowledge of navigation, time and measurement. Such knowledge was immensely powerful for millennia and a closely guarded secret. Many of the symbols we see in secret societies today can be shown to relate entirely and originally to the Sabiists or star worshippers of ancient times. It was the stars and planets that guided them safely to wherever they needed to go. It was the sun that gave them day and the moon lit up the night. By knowing the progress and position of the heavenly bodies, man could measure time and distance. To ages that did not have the clock, satellite guidance systems and cheap flights, these were matters of survival and because of this, they were jealously guarded and secret groups emerged. device was needed for man to measure and he ingeniously developed many things. One of these was the staff and this had become a symbol today of the wizard or wise one. Seen in the hands of the druid, the priest, the augurs and in all manner of ancient depictions, the staff is a marker for us today of one who in the past held great knowledge. Such knowledge was in the hands of those who researched it, discussed it and tested it. These were people in ancient times who needed time to consider these things. They needed to be free of the usual day-to-day -day act of surviving. And so they were special people, set apart from society as a whole and housed in comfortable surroundings. The life of the community depended on these shaman and wise ones. These were the priests casting their gaze towards the heavens, predicting events, guiding the people. For they had the knowledge of the heavenly host. They communicated with the messengers of the gods, the angels, 
or even our ancestors. Folklore, fables and legend have since erupted around these special people. Today, we can believe almost anything is true of them rather than see the basic physical realities of life. The truth is that these early people were very clever and very in tune with nature and its measured cycles. The knowledge was so powerful that tribes would often fight to steal one another's holy men. And so we see emerge from the mists of time another strand of mighty men. These men were essential for the progress of the great knowledge, for they were responsible for protecting the thinkers. What emerged was a warrior brotherhood dedicated to defending the peaceful brothers who were the wise men of the tribe, holding special and unique esoteric knowledge as if they were empowered by the gods themselves. Yet again, around this warrior brotherhood would wind the serpentine spiral of symbolism, which in later years would hide their true purpose. The eventual knowledge of these groups would be deemed sacred and protected. Whether it was practical methods of survival, navigation, measurement, or psychological and spiritual inner wisdom, it would become the ground plan for future secret societies and as populations grew, it would bestow great power and danger upon them. This is the story of the groups who have guarded this sacred knowledge for centuries. From ancient times, there have been tribal priests and warrior elites to protect them and the people in general. In Persia, the Magi watched the stars and worshipped the sun, just as in Europe, the Druids were the wise priests. In Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, and almost anywhere else we can imagine, the same process is to be found. A priest worshipping, mapping, and measuring via the heavenly host, and a warrior class offering protection. There is nothing secret in this system. It has been in existence for an awfully long time. But it is secretive. The priesthood enacted strange and powerful rituals that were strange and peculiar because nobody else was allowed to understand what they were doing. Garbed in myriad symbols, the holy men and women were magical walking talismans, building and maintaining massive power bases. As their strength grew, so too did their warrior brethren, and as time moved on, their symbols became more and more obscure. There was always an opponent, and not always from outside of the immediate tribe. The main adversary was often the king or queen, who throughout time, from Akhenaten to Henry VIII, have done battle with the priesthood. The royal claimed divine power in the name of God, and yet the priesthood were the voice of God. Somehow, they had to work in unison, and around them grew intermediaries. These were very much like our modern day civil servants, running to and fro between departments. These civil servants eventually became more and more powerful in themselves because they had knowledge from both sides and could easily manipulate the events of state. A secret society was born. Based in the knowledge of rulership from the kings, the immense power of the priesthood 
and with the ability to manipulate the military, these civil servants rapidly became the real power base, and it was from within this middle ground that the secret services also emerged. Gods came and went. Kings and lineages died out. Political leaders are voted into and out of office. But the civil service always remains, with their very own bloodlines continuing the family business. The pattern of rule the world over is little different to this triple-headed monster. We have a leadership which from the earliest times was based on the royal dynasties, but in modern times has become more secular and politically based. And we have the intermediaries of the civil servants, including those within the legal, financial and administrative systems. Somehow, all of these elements had to work together. Somehow, a common ground had to be found, and it was. We saw earlier how the origins of many of the symbols found within the world of secret societies originated from Sabianism or star worship. The name Zaba, in fact, derives from an armed troop of Chaldea and may mean many baptisms. They worshiped the pole star as the creative principle, which they called IAO, a device later to be found within Christianity. And according to Freemason, secret society expert, and self-proclaimed antichrist Alistair Crowley also means Isis or nature ruined by Apophis and resurrected by Osiris. A claim with no basis whatsoever but utilized by Crowley as self-propaganda making him appear highly knowledgeable. From this very early time the worship of the stars was akin to and mingled with nature worship. As part of this, rocks and stones were worshipped and used as both products of the Earth Mother and as gifts from the skies as meteorites. The altar stone, the column, the pedestal were all forms of the divine and eventually large Bethels or houses of God were erected across the world, tapping the divine energy. Chaldea, Asia, Egypt, Africa, Greece and Europe were all utilised in this massive and ancient construct of the divine energy. Smaller rocks or meteorites were fashioned into the images of the gods and were known as the Kabiri, the wandering gods. Eventually, this symbolism would fall into alchemy as the philosopher's stone, with many psychological and spiritual additions and meanings. All these gods were in truth representations of the god of light, known from the Egyptian priest to the Druid, and which later became Lucifer, the fallen meteoric angel of light himself. They numbered seven like the planets Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury and the Moon, 
a number which also related to the number of colours which make up white, the colour of purity. Little wonder that the number seven should become immensely important to later adherents of the arcane. In truth, even the mother of Christianity, Judaism, was awash with the worship of stones and stars, worshipping the Bethel stone in the Temple of Jerusalem as the Messiah itself. These Bethel or Bethel stones were to be found far and wide and were often encased in arcs made of holy wood from nature, symbolising the stairway or ascent into the heavens. At the Kaaba in Mecca, the holy meteorite is sacred to Islam to this very day. The spread of Sabianism was so successful that traces of it can still be found within modern secret orders. In the Martinist order and the Rosicrucians, certain grades are still known as Elohim Saboa, the deity who is invoked and adored. The Hadirant says, I am the soul of fire pouring forth its beams upon the lower world, life-giving, light-producing. In fact, in their magical ceremonies, all modern secret occult orders are said to awaken and reawaken powers by means of invoking planetary and elemental spirits using potent divine and secret names. The truth of this is simple. Man believes he is connected to nature via the divine light within himself. This divine within is the spark of light he must awaken in order to truly experience connection to nature itself. Over the course of time, the mind-bending altered states of consciousness required to raise this energy were employed and kept strictly secret. As one Rosicrucian and Freemason put it, there is in nature one most potent force by means of which a single person who would possess himself of it and know how to direct it could revolutionize and change the whole face of the world. This force was known to the ancients and the secret is possessed by the secret schools of the present day. It is a universal agent whose supreme law is equilibrium, and whereby, if science can but learn how to control it, it will be possible to send a thought in an instant around the world, to heal or slay at a distance, to give our words universal success, and to make them reverberate everywhere. This kind of mystical language speaks of power unknown by most ordinary people. It has been used and abused to entice people into the fold and to control them for millennia. The physical actions required to attain this so-called special power reveal simple hallucination and drug-induced trance states, not physical and scientifically provable natural phenomena. It is a control of the mind and subtle suggestion to the initiate reinforces beliefs in hidden secret Tibetan masters or great white brotherhoods. Intoxication, rhythmic movement, meditation, fasting, sex and pain were all utilised to force the mind to alter its state of consciousness. This is a universal device that spread across the world and is found in most secret societies, either practiced or symbolic in rituals. From the drunkenness of Dionysia, the orgies of Manades, the shedding of blood widespread in Asia Minor, and the Gauls mutilating themselves with their own swords to the Christian crucifixion, the flagellants of the Middle Ages, and the dervishes and fakirs of the Middle East, 
all are attempting to gain wisdom and special secret insight. It seems that nobody was free of this mystical mind-bending attempt to become one with God. Even Gnostic sects mirrored their Sufi Islamic counterparts and participated in self-abuse. If such practices are still prevalent within secret societies, and they are, then there is little wonder that they are kept secret. Incredible ceremonies can be found in the mysteries of Eleusis, the esoteric secretive world of the Greeks. In fact, these secretive ceremonies originally derived from ancient Egypt, predating 1500 BC. In one such ceremony, the sacred phallus was erected, a device we know to have originated from Egypt due to the evidence of Clemens of Alexandria. The phallus represented the virile part of Osiris, which was cast into the Nile by Typhon, and to which Isis ordered sacrifices and offerings. It is in fact the IAO, or creative principle, worshipped from the very beginning by the Sabiists, pointing upright to the pole star, and hence perfect balance. The phallus was a stone, seen in India as the Shiva Linga, or Stone of Shiva. It was yet another representation of the stone of the philosophers, to rise again like the phoenix of the alchemists. Shiva, Osiris, or whatever we humans call it, we are in fact still talking about nature and the fallen heavenly light. Elements of all this, and much more, spread abroad and through time and can still to this day be found within religions and secret occult orders. To go through them all would take forever, but what we have found so far can be broken down simply. The stars and planets were worshipped because they directed man. They offered him a means to measure and rule, a way to navigate and to tell the time of day and year. This heavenly process gave rise to the tales of Osiris and Isis and much more the sun and the moon and the cycle of life measured out by the gods. This powerful knowledge was jealously guarded. To participate with these deities, to communicate with them, man developed a means of altering his state of consciousness and believed he was truly one with God. These processes were related to the heavenly host, which guided his way. The priesthood, who understood and developed this knowledge, were powerful, but required protection, and so elite warriors were developed and fostered. The royalty used the tools and power given to him by the gods via the priesthood but a clever balancing act was required between the priesthood, royalty and military, and so intermediaries in the form of civil servants were created. These civil servants now had all the knowledge of the kings and priests and could manipulate the military. The historical stage was set for a series of plays that would often end in bloodshed and revolution. It was led by an underground stream that crossed the outward religions of state. Thank you.
Sufi mystics wearing white and adorned with beards of wisdom matched their brothers in the Judaic Essene, the Druids of Europe, and later the Cistercians of Christianity. Each one sought out the divine light within, whether under the cover of Islam, Christianity, Gnosis or Paganism. Terms that are often more modern than not. Each one held sacred the light of the divine and utilised methods of raising the energy of light within themselves, which they symbolised with the serpent. And each one had a knowledge of the stars, navigation, measurement and held sacred rocks and stones. The Sufis had their warrior brethren, known as the Ishmaelites, and fostered a series of degrees. According to the writer Springett in his Secret Sects of Syria, the Sufis are a secret society of Persian mystics, philosophers and ascetics, whose original religion may have been that of the Sabians or star worshippers. Also, the Sufis admitted to being able to secretly hold to their own faith whilst professing outwardly the faith of their locality. Their initiation involved spending 40 days and nights in the wilderness to connect to the divine and become part of him, something mirrored with the Essene or Gnostics. The Essene or early Gnostics worshipped their heavenly host and were protected by the Cassidians, an elite fighting force known as the Knights of the Temple. The Cistercians created the Knights Templar, who themselves have been accused of heresies akin to the Sufis and Gnostics by the very church they were part of. All these groups and more, such as those of India, Meet within a framework I myself was informed of by a man known to me only as Brother Wan, and who claimed to be a member of an underground stream that knew no boundaries of religion and state. This framework I have checked and cross-referenced and found to be true. That where we find a peaceful brotherhood matched with a warrior elite, we should also discover that their dress shall be white, that they shall wear beards, that they shall hold a secret knowledge of the planets and stars, and that they shall be mystically inclined. These, I was told, would be the clues to the outward elements of the sacred underground stream that still exists to this day, and that influence society on levels we can only guess at. My question has to be this, what is their purpose? Is it simply that they seek the divine in nature? Do they really only wish to uplift humanity as they have claimed? If this is what we believe, then so be it. But in so doing, we shall miss the point of what we have learned so far, that the nature of man is divided and dual-natured, and that where good intentions shall be discovered, so too shall those of greed, lust and envy. History tells us that Sabianism spread across the Middle East, taking with it concepts of the divine light within man himself. We then discover these elements emerging in the strange, non-biblical writings known as the Lost Gospels, and which in fact came from the infamous Essene or early Gnostics who worshipped the serpent and the sun, or light. And from these we find that alchemy and groups such as the Cistercians and Templars kept the secret beliefs alive within Christianity, meeting up again later during the Crusades with the Sufi and Ishmaelite brethren, with whom historians agree the Templars seem to be very friendly. What happens next? Alchemists appear to aid in the forming of secret occult orders, and the Freemasons, Illuminati, and various other secret societies emerge with strangely the exact same principles at heart as our early Sabists. If one were to draw a line through history to connect influences, then my line 
would certainly have to seek out these various so-called separate groups. For it is also from within these self-same groups that truly amazing discoveries are made of new lands and coded maps emerge, utilising the images of solar worship and serpents. This originated with Egyptian priests who formed a confederation of philosophers who united in the study of the art of governing man. The knowledge of the Egyptian priesthood was truly immense. They were masters of astronomy, botany, chemistry and accumulated great libraries of sacred books. Their power stretched for thousands of miles and across thousands of years and nobody matched them, not even the Greeks or Romans who simply seemed to follow the Egyptian underlying methods anyhow and stole a great many of her secrets. Almost all the mysteries can be traced back to Egypt where the initiate into the temple underwent similar processes as modern occult secret societies. First they were subjected to horrifying trials by darkness, fire and water, long fasts and trance-induced visions. If they survived and remained sane, then they were admitted into the priesthood. Hallucination was paramount in their work, using opium, datura, henbane, hashish, cinnamon and laurel to form vapours which caused frenzy in the initiate. From Egypt, the secrets were passed into Judaism, from there into the Essene and Gnostics, and from there sideways into Sufi and Ishmaelite orders, and of course into the Cistercians, Templars and other orders such as the Knights of St John, who continued the Manichaean Gnostic concepts. Next, the secrets just happened to appear within the world of the alchemists and Kabbalists, and from this mix came forth the mysterious and occult secret societies of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries and which today culminate mainly under the flag of Freemasonry. Today, this is the world's largest secret society and is literally a sacred Egyptian order. Whether we look at the Golden Dawn the Rosicrucians, or even the infamous Illuminati, we find that they all revolve around the Freemasons. They were created by or from within the Masons, and often their supposedly separate discoveries have merged back into the fold. And so, we have a modern, worldwide secretive brotherhood, outwardly claiming fraternity and equality, being the culmination of millennia of mystery traditions and vague to say the least about its own origins. Most of those who have made serious studies of the rituals and symbols, beliefs and traditions within the Masonic Lodge, have come to the same conclusion that it is a continuation of the underground stream that has gone through the various periods of world history as we have just seen. It all began in the knowledge of the heavens and the mind of man. It all revolved around strength and so our question has to be today, 
What is the true purpose of the modern elite within the Brotherhood? Is it truly one of charitable works? Yes. Does it still maintain ideas about reaching the divine in balance and wisdom? Yes. Is it an organisation seeking influence and power? Yes. Has it been involved with revolution and scandal? Yes. But wait a moment. Surely, if Freemasonry were truly a continuation of the ancient secretive occult groups, then somewhere hidden within its folds would be the Illuminati, or the illumination of the self. This mysterious energy which is supposedly reignited by adepts. Well, we need to delve a little to discover whether this is true. In 1722, a remarkable book called Long Livers by Robert Sambers was released. The book was a treatise on universal elixirs and was dedicated to the Lodge. In the book, the author indicates that illumination was in fact part of the process within Freemasonry for attaining eternal life. These concepts, we are told, were only to be found at the higher grades and used the language of the Rose and the Cross, the language of the Rosicrucians. These claim that their 14th century mythical founder, Christian Rosencruz, travelled to Damascus, the home of the Gnostics, and Arabia, the home of the Persian Magi, or star worshippers. They claimed to be the Invisibles and to simply be a continuation of ancient mystery sects from Egypt, Eleusis, Samothrace, Persia, Chaldea and India, all homes to the mystical process of enlightenment. To the realist, or the man who maintains a classical Newtonian world of physical truths, these concepts of achieving enlightenment through drug or physically induced methods can seem quite mad. As one Freemason writer once said, one could easily conclude the existence in Freemasonry of two currents which appear contradictory and which are merely complementary, the rationalists and the lumens. What unites and binds them together is the ritual. The rationalist politicians have inspirers. These are the occultists of the lodges. And so we are told that Freemasonry is quite aware of these two worlds, the logical, political and protective world of the ordinary Mason and the inner sanctum and spiritual world of the mystic. Freemasonry has such power and strength today that it can easily support millions of individuals if it so wished. It can also spread the word and propaganda around the world faster than almost anybody else. There is little point in racing after the Rosicrucians, the Theosophists or the Golden Dawn, because they are but streams branching off from the mighty river of the Freemasons. One proof of this statement can easily be found when we take a look at Theosophists. In an article entitled The Anatomy of Revolution by Dargon, we find the following statement. The Theosophical Society was founded by Madame Blavatsky, who was employed as an agent of the Carbonari, which she joined in 1856. The Carbonari are a branch of the Freemasons, and Blavatsky herself was an Oriental Freemason and working for so-called hidden masters who directed her will. As our Masonic author again states, Freemasonry is the place from whence the diverse sects draw their elements. It is from them a preparatory school, a filter, a discipline. In essence, Man can have it any way he wishes and still be connected to the main hub of the Masonic Lodge. And what is the purpose of this group, according to one writer, who was close to the fold? 
theosophy, occultism, Freemasonry, secret sects or mystico civilizers have but one common aim, to assure the liberation of man, to withdraw from him all traditional moral sense in order to be able to enslave him for the good of the interests aimed at. This mysticism is indeed the great Masonic secret, the supreme initiation. It is as old as this world. In 1822, the Prime Minister of Austria addressed the Russian Emperor, Alexander, with the following stark warning. These societies are a malady which eats into the social body in its noblest parts. The evil has already thrust out deep and extended roots. Europe runs a risk of succumbing to attacks upon it ceaselessly, repeated by these associations, absolute monarchies, constitutional monarchies, republics, all are threatened by these levellers. Following these warnings, the revolution in Russia became a reality. It was fostered by the Freemasons from the several lodges still remaining. Even texts written by Karl Marx himself have been shown to be blatant copies of the writings of Adam Weishaupt of the Illuminati from the 18th century. In Hungary, the same procedure occurred and in 1922, the Secrets of a Provincial Lodge was published, exposing the underground work of the Freemasons, leading to the revolution in October of 1918. The book claimed that above all the Freemasons worked through the press, with patient and persistent labour, they succeeded in gaining over most of the press organs. They also aimed at the professionals, schoolmasters and professors, hoping to take control of the minds of the youth. They succeeded. In Spain, a long effort by the Freemasons also brought revolution. Deschamps wrote in 1881, that the revolutions which since 1812 have succeeded each other in Spain have been caused for the most part by the rivalries of the different Masonic factions which always unite in order to fight Christian social order. It began in 1728 when a delegation from the English Grand Master opened a lodge in Spain by the time Charles III came to power, his own courtiers were full of Masons and pretty soon the influence over the government itself was like a stranglehold. By 1766 they had managed to drive their hated enemies, the Jesuits, out of the country. By 1812 the Catholic, a royal power base of Spain, had become servile to the people with real power being held by the Cortes of Cadiz a Freemason constitutional government. By 1830, Freemasons held almost all positions of power, including over 5,000 officers in the military. And by 1868, they had created revolution against Queen Isabella, who was deposed and fled to France. In 1931, the Grand Chancellor of the Spanish Lodge said, at a Grand Lodge meeting. I bring you cordial and fraternal greetings of the Supreme Council of Spain. We have now the Republic. We have six Mason ministers, about 20 Mason high officials, and more than 120 Mason deputies in the Constitutional Chamber. They were indeed very proud of their endeavors, and as if to hammer home their future works, 
The Chancellor then states, Spanish masonry associates itself with the task which the League of Nations has taken up. It is the masons who must create this universal conscience. Later, the League of Nations would become the United Nations and would itself be full of Freemasons in positions of the highest authority. In the history of masonry in Portugal from 1931, we find the following statement. I have noticed that almost all noted men in religious, political and intellectual revolutions of our country during the last two centuries were affiliated with Freemasonry. At the end of these researches, I was convinced that the history of masonry in Portugal was absolutely linked with the history of the country. These tales of Masonic power struggles in Europe can go on and on, from Italy to France, Great Britain to Russia. For instance, in 1903, a Freemason had created the International Court of Justice. By 1917, Freemasons such as Libay and Mioni were setting up the League of Nations. Similar plans were afoot in India, as one of the leading lights in the Theosophists and co-masonry, Annie Besant, stated in 1929 in her own newspaper, New India. Try to perceive the great plan as a whole. India is the keynote. India is the centre of that great storm which shall usher in a splendid peace. No true Theosophist, and certainly no one who is working for the inner government of the world, will be careless of India's welfare. Co-masonry has been given to India that it may be a powerful, organised force for India's service. To aid in the rise of India and the expulsion of the British Empire, a secret, hereditary group of assassins known as the Thuggees were employed. These men were devoted to the goddess Kali, although the actual origin of the Thuggees is much debated. According to the historian Sleeman, it all began in the 14th century, the same period the Freemasons traced their origins to, and the same period the Knights Templar were banned. The origin, however, goes that a Thuggee saint appeared in India, possessing vast sums of money. He had come from Persia, where he had been a disciple of the old man of the mountain, the leader of the Ishmaelites, or assassins, who themselves were friendly with the Knights Templar. Assisting the Thuggees were the peaceful Fakirs, otherwise known as Sufis. The dual brotherhood, it seems, also had a hold in India and would eventually, and with the aid of European secret societies, push the British Empire out. The clever thing about the Thuggees was that for centuries they had been like secret service sleepers, existing as part of society with ordinary lives and jobs, until called upon to rise, then seeping back into society and passing on their secret trade to their children. It seems there is little difference today with the many terrorist groups across the world. And what was the Theosophists and co-masonry's true purpose in aiding this Indian uprising? As Annie Besant herself stated, it is in shaping their aspirations toward nationhood as an integral part of the coming world empire. In short, this secret occult society would shape the opinions of the ordinary people of India in order for this socialist revolution of a new world order to come to fruition. She enlisted the aid of the Labour Party in Britain, 
as well as leading thinkers such as George Bernard Shaw, Ramsay MacDonald and Gandhi. And all of this, it is claimed by the Theosophists themselves, as directed by some inner government of the world. But is there a main centre to this web? Do instructions emanate outwardly to all the strand? The facts are that Grand Lodges have spread into other nations and planted their systems of growth and control so successfully that the history of the world cannot be written now without their involvement. However, even the Masons admit that over time the forms of Masonry became divided. French Mason Albert Lantouin said, The ancient chain must be soldered again, which in making the order more powerful would allow it to influence, in a humanitarian sense, the politics of rulers. His words were taken seriously, and in Geneva 1921, the first meeting of the International Masonic Association was held. In 1922, the orator of the Grand Lodge of France at the IMA meeting stated, my brother Masons, my hope is that Freemasonry, which has done so much for the emancipation of men, and to which history owes the national revolutions of 1789 and 1871, will also know how to make the greatest revolution, which will be the international revolution. By 1930, this powerful organisation included the Grand Lodges of Vienna, Belgium, Spain, France, Greece, Poland, America and many more. At that time, it seemed to spearhead an aggressive attempt to plant lodges in Latin America and undermine the Catholic power base there. What was the reason? It was the very same reason reported by the Grand Orient of France to the International Association of Masons, namely that it desires good relations and links of personal friendship between regular Masons in order to form a chain encircling the globe. Even Islam was not free of Masonic intrigue. In Turkey, revolution was sparked by the Freemasons who had become acquainted with the Turk militarist revolutionaries and by 1908 they had deposed the government. One 19th century opponent of the Freemasons said, Freemasons have contended for the empire of the world as few sovereigns have done and for what end? to be the point of issue of all follies and all monstrosities. The Kabbalah, magic, hermetic philosophy, communications with spirits, magnetism, theosophy, deism, atheism, physical and moral regeneration, vengeance, destruction of empires, the universal republic. If we exclude these follies, what remains? A few honest citizens playing morefully in the chapel of the tomb of Hiram. Today, there are millions of honest citizens playing in the tomb of Hiram, blissfully unaware of the massive game they are part of. I have been asked on several occasions to join by people I respect greatly, but I always refuse because I wish to be bound by no statutes or regulations other than those from which I cannot escape. However, as a man who does not believe in divine rule nor religious control, I can see why so many revolutionaries of the past have been tempted.
However, to my mind, it is no different to Mohammed telling the slaves he would set them free, or Hitler calling his German people the chosen ones, or the Jews stating that they are the children of God. It is a divisive and destructive thing. It sets man against man. The Freemasons argue this point, claiming that they are not religious, and yet they hold dear to the grand architect of the universe, and have created rules, dogma and doctrine more fanciful than any religion I know. Freemasonry is a religion, and does believe in divinity. As the Mason expert Oswald Wirth wrote in the last century, to become as divinity, such was the aim of the ancient mysteries. Today the program of initiation has not changed. No, to me it is another system of control, another method of power under the cloak of being yet again, for the people and by the people. The facts speak for themselves. Great works of charity are done by all religions, including Freemasonry, but great destructive works are also thrust upon us. Often these groups and faiths bring revolution and war, and then claim the high ground when they clean up the mess afterwards, as if they were the guardian angels. In the meantime, innocent people and animals have suffered. The editor of the International Review of Secret Societies in 1934 wrote, The Mason official does not impartially fulfil his duties. He places his public authority at the service of his secret chiefs. The Mason judge is not free. He is obliged to submit to fraternal pressure. There is nothing different today. No rules or regulations given by the Grand Lodges has changed this sentiment. The laws of nations may not allow for such intrigue, but the Mason, who is the judge, political leader and company director, does not need to worry about such things. I have personally been offered help by individuals who are not only openly Freemasons, but also secretly members of certain Sicilian families. Such offers are always rejected out of hand because it is a proven method of enticing people such as me into the fold. Today, there are many influential members of the Freemasons, often unknown to the masses, and yet also involved in altering the mindset and beliefs of people. In the 1980s, a huge book, The Holy Blood, Holy Grail, was released and caused a massive stir. Michael Bajans, one of the authors, is not only a Freemason, but edits one of their magazines. If true, the premise of the book would undermine the Catholic Church and the Christian beliefs entirely, one of the very aims of the Freemasons. This book was the basis for the Da Vinci Code, and Dan Brown himself has utilised Freemasonic concepts to full capacity. Other modern influential men include hundreds of US senators and governors on both sides of the political divide. Popular characters such as astronaut Buzz Aldrin, writer Conan Doyle, President Gerald Ford, industrialist Henry Ford, and even the infamous US pioneer Daniel Boone. In fact, the list itself, when studied in detail, can reveal an amazing web of influence from politics and business through to media and even the church. The web of Freemasonry is now encircling the globe and is incredibly powerful. I recently visited Sydney, Australia, with the television reporter George Knapp from Las Vegas and Daniel, my Australian guide and friend. Over a few beers we were studying a map of the city and noticed the Sydney Masonic Lodge. We all agreed to pay it to visit and to see if we could gain access and take a look around. We were all staggered at the immense size of the structure. 
looking something akin to a major world business or political institution. That's it, go on, present. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for us, there was a large Masonic event occurring, and so we weren't noticed taking a walk all over the building. sort of thing that would absolutely blow away the fundamental Christians in America. Oh, because of Pentagon? Upside down Pentagon. They would absolutely go mad. <laughs> well, that's all the more reason to use that. We're going to have to go to the shop and buy some things. Next, next level up. There's hell, and this is evil. <laughs> <laughs> 
From the earliest of times, the secretive orders have been involved in the worship of nature and the stars and planets. They created icons in rock and stone and claimed these to be the houses of God or Bethels. One location made famous by the Da Vinci Code is Roslyn Chapel in Edinburgh, Scotland. It is in fact a temple to nature itself, adorned with all manner of vegetation, stars, pillars and strewn with Masonic symbolism. These workers in stone are known by one word, Masons. It is the Masons who are responsible for building our sacred spaces and fashioning our stone deities as they have been for centuries. It is the Masons who have placed sacred geometry upon the ground in places such as Washington and London, creating the New Jerusalem along with their political manoeuvring to create the New World Order. Freemason Eliphas Levi himself said, that the purpose of the hidden Templars within Freemasonry was to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. And Albert Pike, another Freemason, said the same thing and pointed out that the hidden order survived under various names throughout time, governed by the unknown chiefs to bring to fruition the new world order, overthrowing throne and altar. Also from early times, the worship of the light was of paramount importance and became known as Lucifer, the light bearer. Lucifer is, as many Masons themselves have stated, a hidden Freemasonic symbol, representation of the inner light or wisdom they wished to attain.
A reflection of the purity and light of the individual, as we learned earlier, was the wearing of white, from the Sufis to the Templars. Today, wearing all white would not be practical, but the most important item of clothing for the Freemason is the apron. According to Masonic tradition, the apron should be of pure white lambskin. Also, there is strong evidence to show that the white-clad Ku Klux Klan of the United States was not only full of Freemasons, but may have indeed been started by them. As for beards, well, the very first degree of the Freemasons tells us that the precious anointing oil ran down from the head to the beard, even Aaron's beard, and that this oil was used for burning to reveal the light. The beard, we are told, should be a symbol of true wisdom from the light within, and even the high priest Aaron was to receive this wisdom. Later, in medieval times, it was only the master mason who could sport a full beard, revealing his status as the wise one. According to the writer known as Dargon, in The Patriot of 1922, here we must note that there has always been among the arcane societies a dual movement, on the one hand mystical, on the other political. Such esoteric bodies as the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross, the Martinists, the Swedenborgians and Theosophists have consisted no doubt largely of harmless enthusiasts to whom mysticism or magic appealed, but they have also been used as the cover for political intrigue and as a net wherein to catch, test and select persons who could be used for subversive ends. All these very ancient elements come to us today via a long line of secretive and powerful occult orders that have encircled the globe and now influence politics, business, media and religion. They have caused revolutions, influenced the setting up of international organisations and created numerous other sects and orders to pursue their purpose, to influence humanity and the creation of a new Jerusalem, a new holy city. Little wonder there is still much warfare and strife in the old one. The long line of the secret unseen hand is quite clearly alive and very, very powerful to this day, deep within the brotherhood we know as the Freemasons. These brotherhoods do not care what state you are from, they do not care what religion you are. They work under the auspices of a Supreme Father, the Grand Architect. It is a unifying creed, a utopian ideal that is detested by fundamentalists across the world. For myself, I neither detest the Freemasons nor do I join, and I say the same of fundamentalists. All men are men and fall short of the glory they call God, regardless of the badge of office or the secret sign. And all men shall continue to be driven by their inner evolutionary instincts, which cause these things in the first place. The difficulty comes when we have to decide who do we believe. Should I defend the traditional values of church, state or royal lineage? Or should I side with the revolutionary factions and support a new world order of socialism? The fact is, the choices are already made and we, the masses, will be manipulated once again to march off on a holy crusade, just as we have for countless generations, marching to the beat of the ruler's drum.